Thank you very much. Before I start, I would like to again thank the local organizers for organizing this wonderful conference. It's been a pleasure uh, to be here. And thank you for inviting me to give this lecture. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is a topic that I've chosen because I think it's uh, simply because it's very interesting. It's a topic I find very fascinating. Uh, and I'm hoping that it's going to be interesting both for the implicit learning researchers who are here and also for the other parts of this audience. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the concept of meta-emotion. And I'm going to discuss the usefulness of applying some distinctions from the metacognition literature to the research on meta-emotion. But before I start, I thought I'd, I'd want to say a few words about why I'm interested in this topic, because I'm really, as you know, an implicit learning researcher. Uh, so why am I interested in the concept of meta-emotion? Well, first of all, I'm a trained clinical psychologist. So deep down, I'm interested in emotional reactions in people. Uh, I've also been working a lot on consciousness research, especially implicit learning research, where I have, among other things, been looking at individual differences in personality, and I've been looking at mood, the influence of mood uh, on learning. So. What I've been looking at there is, among other things, uh, some of the personality scales that I will be talking about today, like the uh, openness to feelings is one of the subscales I've been using. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've also been working on metacognition in more applied educational contexts. Uh, and at my university, I teach a course in affect and cognition. So no wonder I think that this topic is very interesting. And I hope you think the same. Can you all hear me, by the way? Good. The idea I'm going to present today is quite simple. And maybe that's a good thing, because it's the last talk of a very long day. Um, but I'll say a little bit about the structure of the talk, so you know uh, roughly what I'm going to be talking about. And then you will also be able to anticipate when we are getting closer to the end. Um, I'm first going to say a few words about emotions. Uh, I'm then going to go into the concept of meta-emotion. And I'm going to give some examples uh, of how meta-emotion has been studied in different areas of psychology. I'm then going to turn to metacognition. I'm going to present a distinction which has been made within metacognition research, uh, which is a more established research area, which I think many of you are highly familiar with. Um, okay. Then I'm going to see whether we can apply this distinction to meta-emotion research. Uh, and finally, I'm going to highlight a couple of implications for the study of meta-emotion. So this is what I'll be talking about. What is an emotion? Well, as you probably all know, emotions refer to short-lived, conscious, and intense experiences that usually have a highly accessible uh, and salient cause. It's also assumed to have clear prototypical cognitive content, uh, for example, disgust, anger or fear. And there are several components to an emotion, including physiological, phenomenological, behavioral and motivational components. Today's topic is not emotions, though. Today's topic is meta-emotion. Meta-emotion can be globally defined as, no, not very surprising, but emotions about emotions. Um, Mendonca, who I'm going to refer to again a bit later, says that meta-emotions can have the same phenomenological quality as the primary emotion. For example, you feel sad about feeling sad, or it can have a different quality. For example, you can feel angry about being sad. So the question we should be asking ourselves right now Okay, well, I forgot one point. It can occur either simultaneously or following the primary emotion in time. Uh, so you can feel sad about feeling sad at the same time, or you can feel sad and then a little while later you feel sad that you were sad. So the question we should be asking ourselves now, what am I currently feeling? Are you currently experiencing an emotion? Maybe not, but maybe you are. Maybe you're feeling happy, maybe somebody just told you a joke. Uh, maybe you just received some bad news and you feel sad. 
just think about that for, for a little while. You don't need to tell me how you're feeling. Uh, and then we should ask ourselves, how do I feel about what I am currently feeling? So let's say you feel really happy and thrilled because you just heard a very funny joke. Maybe you are worried that you are happy because it wouldn't be appropriate to laugh in the middle of this lecture. Uh, so there are all sorts of combinations which are possible. Uh, you can be sad about being sad, you can be annoyed that you are sad, you can uh, feel compassion or acceptance toward your emotion, uh, and you could also be trying to do something. Maybe you feel very, very happy and you try to, to regulate that. So all of this would be uh, within the range of what we call meta-emotions. A few words about the background, where does this concept originate from? The concept was first introduced within family therapy research by Gottman and colleagues in 1996. They refer to the so-called meta-emotional philosophy as parents' organized set of feelings and thoughts about emotions that they communicate to their children. Uh, and they refer to different styles. For example, an emotional coaching philosophy of a parent would mean that the parent is aware of emotions in themselves, that they can talk about emotions with their children in a differentiated manner, that they would be aware of these emotions in their children, that they would assist their children with the children's emotion. So whether the child feels sad or angry or distressed, uh, they would be able to kind of help them out regulating these emotions. So they would act like a kind of emotion coach, a role model for the child. So this would be a good, um, a kind of healthy meta-emotional philosophy. Um, in their study they also showed that parents' meta-emotional philosophy was related to various uh, outcome variables that reflected the child's well-being. So for, for example, how well the child would do at school. Uh, they also claim that it's various psychophysiological measures that are correlated with the meta-emotional philosophy of parents. Okay, but I'm not going to talk about family therapy today. I'm going to talk about how the concept has been used elsewhere, applied elsewhere in psychology. Um, but I just thought I'd give you the, the history of the concept. In a recent paper, Mendonca has presented a summary uh, of, th this is actually some psychology research, but also some research from philosophy. Uh, and she points to some central properties of meta-emotion, um, some of which qualify them as separate and distinguishable from primary emotions. First of all, she emphasizes that the phenomenology of emotions and meta-emotions can take a variety of different forms. So, in the same way as primary emotions may differ, meta-emotions may also be of many different kinds. So, as I said, you can feel sad about being sad, you can be angry about being sad, you can be compassionate about being sad. Uh, so, it would be a much broader concept than concepts like, for instance, affect phobia which is a more kind of generalized attitude towards uh, emotions, regardless of what the emotion is, and which is also in itself less differentiated. Uh, but what Mendonca says is special to meta-emotion is their reflexivity. In other words, the experience of a meta-emotion could change the phenomenological quality could have an impact on the first order emotion. So one example which is given in this paper is that, uh, I don't know, some of us might have experience with this, that a blush of embarrassment may be intensified by embarrassment over the blush. So you're in a vicious cycle there. Um, okay. An additional point that is raised by Mendonca is that whenever we teach our children about emotion, or whenever teachers teach their students about emotions, this will necessarily have to, re to occur through reflections about meta-emotion. So actually, Mendonca's point is that the concept of meta-emotion is quite important to the whole area of emotion, to any theory of emotion. <coughs> 
Mandonka also points to some central questions within meta-emotion research, which have not yet been answered. For example, are there limits to the number of layers? So think about how you're currently feeling. Let's say you're feeling anxious. Um, think about how you feel about how you're currently feeling. Let's say you're annoyed that you're anxious. Could I then ask you an additional question? How are you feeling about how you're feeling about how you're currently feeling? Are you compassionate about being annoyed that you are anxious? So how long can we carry on uh, with these steps? So that's one question. Another question is to what extent the phenomenology of emotions and meta-emotions can be understood separately. One question here is whether there are certain types of emotion that can occur only at a certain level. And the answer to that question I think would be yes. For example, jealousy. It's very difficult to think of jealousy as a secondary or as a meta-emotion. Uh, there might be other examples as well. Uh, another question is whether meta-emotions are generally ver veridical and what is meant by that? Well, by veridical here we mean whether they actually reflect the existence of a primary emotion. Or could it sometimes be the case that you have a meta-emotion in cases where it could be shown that the emotional object or the primary emotion was not present? Or what about emotional repression? Uh, when people repress an emotion, this could mean that they either don't notice them or they misinterpret them. Uh, so Mendonca's conclusion is that meta-emotions are not necessarily veridical, but it's a question that could be discussed. This is just a quick introduction to the concept. Um, I think the questions raised by Mendonca are important questions, but today I'm not going to focus on answering them. I'm going to focus on a more fundamental or a more basic question. Namely, how do we define matter emotion? So let's step back. How do we define this uh, concept? Um, and whether, and as you're going to see in a minute, there are there's not a kind of a general agreement on how we, we should specifically define it. So the question is whether inconsistency in the literature could be resolved if we think of meta emotion as a multifaceted phenomenon, just like meta cognition. Uh, if we were able to reach a consensus on how we should specifically define meta-emotions, it would be easier to compare and combine findings across different studies. Uh, and it could also broaden the range of measures by which meta-emotions can be assessed. Before I turn to examples from the literature, uh, I'm just quickly going to mention a couple of related phenomena in case some of you are sitting here thinking, okay, how does re this relate to this or that phenomena I've heard of before? Uh, a closely related concept is that of meta mood, which probably some of you are familiar with. Um, mood can be defined as an appraisal of our general well being. Um, so it doesn't relate or it's not elicited by a specific object or a specific event. Uh, and moods are assumed to be more influenced by global changes in the individual surroundings, whilst emotions are more influenced by local changes. Uh, within mood, the research area of mood, uh, people have talked about uh, meta mood. Um, and Meyer and Goschke separate, distinguish between the direct experience of mood and meta experience of mood. Uh, more specifically, they talk about meta mood as thoughts and feelings about mood states. And they say that meta mood is an intrinsic part of uh, a mood experience. So whenever you experience a mood, it's often the case that you have these thoughts and feelings relating to your mood. And they have developed something called the trait meta mood scale, which I'm going to refer back to later today, which measures people's attention to their moods, clarity of mood, and people's attempts to regulate their moods. Uh, in a more recent paper, My Meyer and Salovey argue that trait meta mood is related to emotional intelligence. 
Um, so how is meta emotion different from meta mood? Well, there's, uh, well first of all, because emotions and, mo and moods are two different, although related, they are two different phenomena. Um, meta emotions and meta mood would also differ, uh, including differences in the reg regula regulatory component of it. Uh, however, a lot of what I say today might also apply to meta mood, and some of the literature I refer to use meta mood and meta emotion interchangeably, which is quite confusing when you start looking into this literature. So there seems to be quite a fussy boundary between the two. I just thought I'd mention it uh, in case some of you wanted to clarify that before I go on. Another related phenomenon is emotional intelligence, which can be defined as the capacity to carry out sophisticated information processing about emotions and emotion relevant stimuli, and to use this information as a guide to thinking and behavior. Unfortunately, there's no reference there, but it's Myron Salovey, 2008. Um, okay, so emotional intelligence has also been measured with some of the self-report scales I'll be talking about today. It's also been divided into sub-components in some of the which has some resemblance with uh, some subcomponents of meta emotions that I'm going to suggest today. But a difference is that emotional intelligence is seen as a trait variable, uh, where the focus is on relatively stable individual differences, whereas e each component of meta emotions that I'm going to suggest today can be seen as involving an interplay between trait and state. Okay. So with that out of the way, I'm going to present some examples of how people, how researchers deal with the concept of meta-emotion in different fields of psychology. These examples are not necessarily representative. I've picked some examples just to illustrate how people are looking into this phenomenon. My first example is Okay, my first example is from personality psychology. I have one example from media psychology, one example from decision-making research, and one from addic addiction research. So these are quite different fields. So, okay, so this is a study by Mittmanns Gruber et al. 2009. They studied uh, the extent to which subjective well-being could be predicted by three sets of variables. First of all, whether it can be predicted by experiential avoidance, so uh, being non-accepting of various mental events. Secondly, whether it would be predicted by mindful awareness, so being, pres being attentive in the present moment. And finally, whether it can be predicted by meta-emotion. They broadly define meta-emotion as emotional reactions about one's emotional self. So it's an emotion where the object that the emotion relates to is another emotion. Uh, they see meta-emotion as a subclass of secondary emotions. I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of secondary emotion, but it uh, is defined as, those res as a class of emotion or emotional responses that are secondary uh, to more primary, what they refer to as more primary emotions and which, and which may act as defenses against these such as feeling hopeless when angry. So whether or not you would agree that it's a defense mechanism, it is an emotion that relates to another emotion and importantly secondary emotions are follow primary emotions in time. Um, so it's also a temporal concept so this they say it's a subclass of secondary emotions, so they would follow other emotions in time. Uh, this contradicts what I said earlier, that other people say that meta-emotions may occur simultaneously as the primary emotion. Uh, I'm not going to go down that road, but this is anyway how they define meta-emotion. Um, okay. They focus on the regulatory fo function of meta-emotion. So the reason we have meta-emotion is in order to regulate our emotional reactions to events in the world. And they say that the quality of a meta-emotion may provide information about the particular regulatory process that operates on the primary emotion. So if you're angry, that you're angry, 
that may have different consequences than if you're compassionate about being angry. So in the first case, you might want to stop being angry. You might want to take some action so that you're no longer angry. Distract yourself or whatever. If you're compassionate about your own anger, you would not necessarily attempt to alleviate it. So the idea is that the phenomenolo phenomenological quality of meta-emotion reflects qualities of self-regulation. Okay. They measured everything with self-report. So there were three different sets of variables, as I said, which they wanted to see how they related to subjective well-being, including, um, okay, so including a so the so-called meta-emotion scale that they have developed was included as a measurement of uh, di individual differences in meta-emotion. This is a self-report questionnaire assessing six suggested components of meta-emotion. I don't know even if you can read this, but pro probably those of you at the first row. Uh, but I'm just going to refer, so these are the different subscales and the different items. So there's one subscale called anger, one called compassionate care, interest, contempt, shame, thought control, suppression. So an item from the suppression scale, for, for example, I cannot come to grips with strong emotions. Um, okay. So what they found was that in a non-clinical sample, individual differences in meta-emotion, as operationalized here, predicted subjective well-being over and above relate the related variables, trait mindfulness and experiential avoidance. So meta-emotion had a distinct effect. Um, and what they say is that to maintain well-being, it might be as rewarding to minimize negative meta-emotions and to have an acceptive stance towards one's own emotions as to minimize the negative emotions themselves. Which is an interesting conclusion, uh, I think. Okay, let's turn to a completely different area of psychology, media psychology. The starting point of this study, which is conducted by Bartsch et al. 2010, is this question we may all have asked ourselves. Why do we enjoy watching scary and sad movies? We don't go to the movies to just look at happy films. We actually like to experience horror and drama. So what they wanted to find out, their hypothesis was, okay, maybe this can be understood in terms of individual differences in better emotions. Maybe some people like to feel scared in certain contexts, for instance. Um, they define meta-emotion as emotions that have other emotions as their appraisal object and evaluative thoughts and feelings about one's emotion. So it's kind of similar to the definition that we've seen before, but now suddenly it also includes thoughts, which is kind of central in the initial discussions about what meta-emotion is and what it isn't. This is something they would disagree on. Some people think that's a component of meta emotion, some think it's not. Okay, so they further say that meta emotions are related to concerns beyond the scope of the primary emotion. So let's say you're scared because there's a lion running towards you and your current concern is to get away. Uh, so you're scared because of the lion and you try to get away, that's your motivation. But let's say it's a very unrealistic example, this, but let's just carry on with it anyway. <laughs> so let's say you're embarrassed about being scared because there's a whole group of people standing uh, nearby or they're filming you or whatever. Uh, so the concern of this secondary emotion would be completely different from the concern of the primary emotion. Do you see the point? Um, okay. So, and meta-emotions involve affective reactions toward the primary emotion and motivation to change the expected course of the primary emotion. So, let's move on to their study. Uh, they measured meta-emotion in what they call moviegoers, that's a funny word I think, in people who went to the movies. Uh, so, they chose people who were on their way to watch a drama 
film, so sad movie or a uh, horror movie. They gave them some questionnaires before and after having watched the films. So before watching the films, they would hand out some personality questionnaires and they would wait for them for the film to be finished and then they handed out some uh, scales to measure emotion, uh, how much they enjoyed the film and various measures of uh, meta emotion. Okay. So what they measured was primary emotions about the movie. Um, so again, self-report questionnaire all, all over the place. Uh, they measured, they asked people to indicate the degree of arousal, the valence of the emotion and categorize their particular emotion uh, according to distinct categories. They also measured individual differences in meta-emotion, which could be referred to as trait meta-emotion. They measured this with a need for affect scale. Some of you might be familiar with this scale already. It consists of two different dimensions. First of all, the tendency um, to approach, uh, ver the tendency to approach emotions versus the tendency to avoid emotions. Um, okay. They also yeah, let me just give you an example of two different items. One approach item is, I feel that I need to experience strong emotions regularly. So if you strongly agree to that one, that adds to your score on the approach subscale. An avoidance item would be, for instance, emotions are dangerous. They tend to get me into situations that I would rather avoid. Okay. They also measured emotions about current primary emotions or about emotions that people had just experienced when they were in the cinema. Uh, this was also assessed with self-report questionnaires. There were 36 items rated on a 1 to 5 scale. They identified two factors in state meta-emotion. The first one was meta-emotion enjoyment. For example, I like this feeling or it was a pleasure to experience these feelings. Uh, the other factor is labeled meta-emotion normative appreciation. Norm normative appreciation, for example, I find these feelings embarrassing. Okay, I'll quickly comment on the results. If anyone is curious as to whether there were differences in emotions between drama and horror movies, I can tell you that drama movies were associated with more negative emotions. This might be a property of the particular films chosen, but just so you know. They found that high need for affect approach predicted certain features of primary emotions. More specifically, um, people who were high in need for affect approach experienced more negative feelings and they also reported a higher frequency of ambivalent primary emotions, for example, fascination, surprise, interest, or being moved. Um, the main interest... Okay. They also found that high need for affect avoidance predicted lower meta-emotion enjoyment in conjunction with the film uh, and lower normative uh, appreciation. They found that high need for affect approach predicted higher normative appreciation. So they concluded that need for affect is a general predictor. So this, this was regarded as the trait meta-emotion variable, so the individual difference variable. They regarded it as a general predictor of individual differences in the experience of emotions and state meta-emotions. So this study says something about the relationship between emotions and meta-emotions and between trait and state meta-emotion. Moving again to a completely different area, decision-making research. This is a study by Coven from 2011 uh, where they looked at the relationship between meta-emotion and utilitarian decision-making. Utilitarian reasoning um, means uh, that you regard or it's, uh, that you choose uh, an alternative that is that involves so-called the good of many 
that benefits a lot of people at the expense uh, of benefiting one person. That was really poorly defined as late in the day. Let's, let me give you an example. So let's say you have uh, the following uh, scenario. I ask you the following question. Is it appropriate to forcibly remove a man's kidney in order to save the lives of six vitamin deficient people? Um, so if you say yes, it's appropriate to remove this guy's kidney in order to save six people, that would be an example of a utilitarian decision. Uh, the idea is that this type of decision requires cognitive control of your emotions. Uh, and what Hoven wanted to, to address was whether uh, this could be understood in term, within a dual process model of moral decision making. Um, so if it is the case that this type of decision requires control of your emotions, then maybe we would find that people who are good at controlling their emotions would make more of these types of decisions. Okay, so here meta-emotion is seen as a skill which is relevant for using emotional information adaptively. For example, when faced with this type of dilemma. I'm sorry about the typo there. Okay, so people in this study were presented with so-called high, they were presented with high conflict personal dilemmas where they read a scenario like the one I described to you. And then they had to decide whether it's appropriate to harm one individual in order to save the lives of several individuals. Uh, they measured meta-emotion by self-report, as a lot of other people tend to do. Uh, so the scales they used were the Toronto Alexithymia scale, the trait meta-mood scale, which I said earlier, it's a meta-mood scale, it's not a meta-emotion scale, although these people talk about meta-emotion, and it's been suggested to reflect emotional intelligence. So a bit messy, um, the different scales and concepts used in this area of research. Uh, an example of a, an item on this scale here is I'm often confused about what emotion I am feeling. An item on the trait meta mood scale, for example, is I am able to describe my current mood. They also included a mood awareness scale, which where an example item is I don't pay much attention to my moods. So we see that they use mood scales, but they talk about meta-emotion. I'm um, not quite sure why. Anyway, based on uh, factor analysis, they grouped all these items into two factors. Um, clarity of emotion was one of these factors, and attention to emotion was, uh, was the other. They found that utilitarian decision-making was negatively related to clarity of emotion. Um, so what they suggested was that high clarity of emotion may imply longer-lasting emotional reactions to negative stimuli, which may in turn impair cognitive control and reduce utilitarian decision-making. Then to our final example from addiction research. This is a study from 2013 where they look at the tendency to drink to cope. Uh, it's already established uh, that the tendency to drink to cope is related to the tendency to experience negative primary emotions more often than other people, so what we refer to as trait emotionality. Uh, however, re recent research has suggested that this is an insufficient explanation. It only explains parts of the picture. So the authors hypothesize that uh, drinking to cope could also be related to individual differences in how people feel about their negative emotions. So they included meta-emotion as a variable. And meta-emotion here is seen as triggered by appraisals of any of the several components that comprise the given emotional reaction. So again, emotions are special in the case in the sense that the object of the emotion is another emotion. But these people talk about it in a more specific way. So they say that meta-emotion can be triggered by appraisals of any of the several components that comprise a given emotional reaction. And what does that mean? Well, it means that it could potentially occur in response to an emotion physiological changes, 
So whenever your heart is pounding, you could have a meta emotion related that is elicited by the heart pounding, regardless of whether the heart is pounding because you're anxious or because you're excited. Um, so that's a slightly different definition again. Uh, they studied two forms of meta emotion, or two, they used two scales to measure meta emotion. Uh, it's probably a better way to put it. First of all, anxiety sensitivity measured by self report the anxiety sensitivity index. Um, they also um, included the non acceptance subscale of the difficulties in emotion regulation scale, uh, which has to do with. Yeah, difficulties in accepting one's negative emotions. Um, what did they fi find? Well, they didn't find um, a unique contribution of meta-emotion, unlike what they predicted. So they found that the tendency to drink to cope was related to negative affect and trait anxiety, but not to the two forms of meta-emotion. But... <coughs> Both anxiety sensitivity and non-acceptance were associated with trait anxiety and non-acceptance was also associated with increased negative affects. So what they concluded was that meta-emotion might have an indirect effect. What can we conclude so far? And how do we feel about it? Well. First of all, it's from these examples at least, it seems that meta-emotion is considered an important or a slightly important uh, predictor of various indices of well-being and mental health. They also show that different disciplines share, the disciplines share the same basic understanding of the phenomenon. So meta-emotions are emotions that have other emotions or components of emotions as their appraisal objects. However, they also illustrate some inconsistencies in uh, how meta-emotion is specifically operationalized. Also, I think the degree of overlap across different studies is unclear. Um, okay, so one question that comes to my mind when I read these papers is, whether meta-emotion is seen as an emotion in its proper sense, with physiological, motivational, uh, phenomenological aspects, or is it much more narrow? Is it just kind of some kind of self-regulation mechanism? Or maybe it's a bit of both, I don't know. Um, okay, then to the degree of overlap across different studies, when you read about all these different scales and measurements and subscales, it's also striking that there is some parallels here. So, for example, a subscale called attention to emotion, to what extent does that overlap with what other people refer to, from Mittmann's group, but for example, refers to as interest in emotions. The same goes for a subscale labeled contempt, shame. How does that relate to another subscale called non-acceptance? Okay. Then the question is, okay, can principles from metacognition research help us? Uh, and as, as I told you initially, this con the whole concept of meta-emotion is not uh, my... I don't have a background in that field, it's something I recently became interested in, but this is much more uh, where I come from, which is why I think it's interesting to see if we can um, use principles from this line of research to help us understand meta-emotion. Okay, when Gottman et al. first introduced the concept of meta-emotion, he specifically addressed the similarity between meta-emotion and metacognition. He said the notion we have in mind parallels metacognition, which, as we all know, refers, can be defined as the executive functions of cognition. It can also be defined in other ways. But anyway, just to simplify, this is a quote from the original 96th paper. What is surprising, I think, is that metacognition and meta-emotion are rarely discussed in conjunction with each other. Okay. How am I doing for time? Okay, well, a little more. Okay, yeah. Okay, metacognition. Refers to cognition about cognition, 
Uh, it's a concept phenomenon which is studied within educational psychology, within cognitive psychology, importantly also within consciousness research, where it's by many regarded as a criterion of consciousness. Uh, okay. One common distinction within metacognition research is to distinguish between, on the one hand, metacognitive experiences, which is any conscious cognitive or affective experience that accompany and pertain to any intellectual enterprise. That's an old definition, but uh, metacognitive experiences are often studied within psychology, for example, feeling of knowing, judgment, confidence ratings, judgments of learning, etc., etc. Then we have metacognitive knowledge, which refers to uh, knowledge, kind of declarative knowledge about one's own cognitive processes. And then we have metacognitive skills which can be defined as the deliberate use of strategies in order to control cognition. So this is a very, sim it's very simple uh, way of, uh, of uh, understanding metacognition as a, broad, as a phenomenon in its broad sense. Uh, so my simple suggestion, can we understand meta-emotion in the same way? Can we think about meta-emotion as consisting of meta-cognitive experiences, no, meta-emotional experiences, meta-emotional skills and meta-emotional knowledge? Is this one way to think about meta-emotion which helps us understand the different studies and the different ways of, of uh, talking about meta-emotion? So let's first address meta-emotional experience. This can be understood as kind of the raw feel of meta-emotion. Um, meta-emotion is often described as a meta-level experience in ongoing emotional experience. Uh, so it has a phenomenological quality which is as diverse as is the case for primary emotions. Um, and this kind of subjective component of meta-emotion, not necessarily accessible to conscious introspection, may be seen as corresponding to metacognitive experiences. And I suggest we can call these meta-emotional experiences. Okay. So they may include all sorts of feelings that we've discussed today. Um, okay. So if we look back at the scales and the measurements we've been studying today, which ones would fit in here? Well, for example, what Bartsch et al. in the study of these movie goers referred to as meta-emotion enjoyment, items like I like this feeling, I enjoy feeling like this or that, would kind of belong <coughs> in this category. Um, there's subscale normative appreciation for instance, I find this feeling embarrassing, could also belong in this category. These are not kind of, the suggestions I'm making is not the definite right answer, it's just my attempt to try and place these different phenomena within the three areas. Then we have the subscale anxiety sensitivity that was included in the drinking to cope study. This one also addresses a subjective reaction associated with the experience of anxiety, so whether one feels scared, embarrassed or worried uh, about being anxious. And then we have something called the non-acceptance subscale of the difficulties in the emotion regulation scale with items like, I experience my emotions as overwhelming and out of control. Okay, meta-emotional knowledge. If we, this could be defined as knowledge about the emotional reactions of oneself and others. Um, okay, Gottman et al. in the original study on meta-emotion distinguished between met parents' meta-emotional philosophy and their actual way of approaching uh, their own and their children's emotions. So, this kind of organized set of feelings and thoughts about emotions uh, seems in some ways parallel to the idea of metacognitive knowledge, which refers to people's declarative knowledge of their uh, cognitive processes. Uh, declarative metacognitive knowledge has been subdivided into different knowledge areas. So for metacognitive knowledge we talk about people's metacognitive knowledge of themselves and others. Uh, we talk about metacognitive knowledge of task versus context. context. And maybe we can make a similar subdivision of declarative meta-emotional knowledge, 
thinking, uh, distinguishing between knowledge of one's own emotional reactions, knowledge of other people's typical emotional reactions to various things, uh, knowledge about specific emotions and knowledge about situational and behavioral factors that may influence a person's emotions. Um, okay, so some of the items in the self-report scales I've talked about earlier would fit into this uh, subcategory, for example, the non-acceptance subscale of difficulties in emotion regulation scale, attention to emotion, clarity of emotion. Um, I don't have time to go into all of this, but you see where I'm heading. That is it possible to understand and to classify some of all these subscales into this particular category as well. And when Mandonka talks about educating emotion to children and students and pupils, this is the area uh, I think that that is about. Okay, several authors address the control or regulatory function of meta emotions. Um, for, for instance, Mandonka talks about uh, reflexivity as kind of the defining property of meta emotion that makes it different from other from uh, primary emotions. Uh, this aspect of meta emotion can be seen as parallel to the concept of metacognitive skills and could be labeled meta emotional skills. So this is about the control regulatory function of meta emotion and this idea um, that meta emotions often try to change or alleviate the primary emotion. Okay, subscales which seem to address meta emotional skills are the thought control and suppression subscales of the meta emotion scale by Mitman Skrubar et al., the repair subscale of the trait meta mood scale, and Toronto Alexithymia scale items like I am able to describe my feelings easily. Okay. It's also possible that the concept of meta-emotional skills could be subdivided further. I don't think I have time to go into this, but this, just to give you a small indication of what I'm thinking about, is that you can think of certain strategies being concerned with changing an ongoing emotion here and now. So I'm feeling anxious, and I try to do something about that feeling here and now. But you could also think about meta-emotional skills, which are more kind of superordinate, uh, which has to do with planning, predicting uh, strategies that can be used, for example, uh, to, to prevent a future emotional reaction. Okay. Even though I suggest that these three components of meta-emotions could be seen as uh, different from each other, they of course would be related to each other. Um, Okay, so for instance, as I said to you quite early in the talk, that Mitman, Skrubar et al. say that the quality of a meta emotion says something about the, regula the regulatory function of, uh, of the meta emotion. So there is some link between meta emotional experience and actually taking some action uh, in relationship to the primary emotion. In addition, both the phenomen phenomenological quality of meta-emotions and which regulatory activities or meta-emotional skills are initiated could also be influenced by metacognitive knowledge of, for instance, whether it would be normal or appropriate to react in a certain way in a certain situation. So even though I've tried to argue that these are three components of meta-emotion, they are, of course, interrelated. What are the implications of thinking about meta emotions in this way? Well, first of all, I think it's pretty clear that it would be beneficial if researchers that use the concept of meta emotions, who argue that meta emotions are involved in a certain um, mechanism, uh, specify which aspect of meta emotions is being addressed. Are we looking at meta-emotional meta experiences here in their raw form? Are we, t are we looking at skills? Are we looking at meta-emotional knowledge? That would make it easy to compare findings across studies and to also build some broader models for understanding the phenomenon of meta-emotion and how it relates to emotions. 
a very important point, I think, is that thinking about matter emotions this way makes it evident that we need to develop more precise me methods for measuring the different forms of matter emotion. In my opinion, self-report measures may not always be appropriate. So with self-report, pe people might say something about what they think their meta-emotional skills are, for example. They might say something about what they mm, think they typically would do in a situation of this and that. They would, might say that um, these self-report scales are also used to study the meta-emotional experience itself. So I'm feeling like this or that after having seen this in this movie. Um, or I've, I feel happy about being scared at the movie. Uh, but it might not be the case that self-report scales of this kind are the best ways of measuring this type of phenomenon. Uh, if we look at how metacognitive experience is being studied within cognitive psychology, um, they are normally measured in direct conjunction with the cognitive event to which they relate. So for instance, feelings of knowing are, are collected in conjunction, conjunction with memory attempts. Judgments of learning are collected or rated in conjunction with learning specific uh, items in a learning task and similarly for confidence ratings, etc. So the question then is whether it's possible to develop procedures for measuring meta-emotional experiences in direct conjunction with the primary emotional experience and maybe even without self-report. Um, it should, however, be noted that the concept of meta-emotional experiences would be a lot, might be a lot broader than the concept of meta-cognitive experiences, because if we also include the physiological component, the behavioral uh, component, the motivational component, etc. Okay, so the same pl problem applies to meta-emotional skills. Uh, maybe I do have a ten. Well, maybe we have access to some of our meta-emotional skills, but maybe not to all of them. Maybe. I have a tendency to distract myself uh, every time I feel angry, but it could very well be the case that I'm not aware of it. So using self-report to assess these types of skills may not be the best idea in the world. Okay, finally, we need to further explore the possible links between the suggested components of meta-emotion. Um, and as it also is related to this point, it would be very interesting to explore the extent to which each of these components is associated with consciousness. Um, another related question is the question of whether uh, consciousness of a meta-emotion implies consciousness of the underlying emotion um, within, and now I'm almost afraid of saying this because this is from the clinic, clinical psychology area, not empirically verified, but a classic paper by Greenberg from 2002 states that secondary emotions, some people claim that meta-emotions is a subtype of secondary emotions, they need to be explored in order to get to the more primary generators. So within that perspective, becoming more aware of your meta-emotions could be a way of becoming more aware of your primary emotions. So these are all questions that would be interesting to look at. And now I'm wondering, how are you feeling now? <laughs> uh, and how do you feel about how you're currently feeling? Um, and regardless of how you may be feeling, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I would also like to thank Bjorte Furnes, who is uh, a co-author on a manuscript that's referred to here, which we recently submitted to Emotion uh, Review. So thanks to all of you. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, I can easily imagine the scenario that uh, my son keeps annoying me and uh, I get very angry and I send him to the room and then I realize that, okay, it might not have been a great idea, but it's, yeah, I'll, I was right that I was angry. Yeah, I was right that I was angry, 
but uh, still it might have not might not have been the correct way to deal with the situation. So but I'm still happy with myself being angry at my son, but I know that this might not be the correct way to solve the problem. Uh, actually both layers are in uh, so both sides are in relation with both skills and knowledge, meta, meta emotional skills and meta emotional knowledge. And the question is, uh, do you think or do you find it relevant to differentiate thoughts on emotions versus emotions on emotions? Yeah, that's something I didn't have time to go into, but obviously that's also the question of it's the question of whether matter emotion also involves a cognitive component. Some people would say yes, some people would say no. I would say it's very difficult to think about matter emotions without also thinking about the kind of a cognitive component to it. Um, so also in that situation you're describing, or in any emotional situation, you could you could easily think that okay, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm angry and I'm being angry makes me scared and then you reflect upon that and you may even start thinking okay, why am I scared every time I'm angry and you might get some insight which might be interesting or not but but anyway yes certainly <coughs> there would be and what you could I mean you can think what I've suggested here is you can think of meta, meta emotional knowledge as kind of stored knowledge uh, long-term memory representations of how you typically react in a certain situation but there and then in the metacognitive experience there could also be a cognitive layer so as you express anger and your son sits there looking at you you might also of course reflect upon your current emotional reaction so the answer is yes okay one more question yeah и на самом деле осталось немножко загадочно, все-таки что же есть такое метаэмоция. Я попробую привести следующим образом. Я одновременно, наверное, могу переживать огромное количество разных эмоций. Ну, например, актер, который идет душить без демона в двухсотый раз, у него, с одной стороны, нет никакого желания ее душить, потому что это 199 раз он ее задушил. И эмоция пресыщения вот от этого заключения в нем сидит, но одновременно он вызывает у себя реакцию гнева, иначе ему ее не задушить. При этом он также понимает, что да, сегодня я ее ну, исключительно хорошо душу и чувствует себя от этого как актер хороший. Да еще зал реагирует на это. И плюс к этому через мой грим приступает в ход и тут подул приятный ветерок. Вот. Okay, so the question is, short version is, what is meta emotion? Because actually it's not very distinguished. If you imagine an actor who is going to the stage to kill this demonic, so 200 times, by the 150th time he's very tired, and actually he doesn't have any anger, but he um, kind of forces himself to feel this anger and feel some kind of meta emotion, oh, I will kill her today in a very peculiar way, different from the other one. То есть это с одной стороны каждая эмоция, это как сопровождаться морем других эмоций, и что считать не эмоции не до конца понятно. Но тут же другое. Каждая эмоция, она одновременно обязательно является метой эмоции. Потому что если я не переживаю никакую эмоцию, то у меня нет эмоций. А если я ее переживаю, то у меня есть удивление по поводу того, что я ее переживаю, потому что а с чего бы вдруг я ее переживаю. Если нет, нет никакого понимания своей эмоции, то и не может быть эмоций. So, and then to continue, so how to define the meta emotion because every emotion is in a way a meta emotion about itself and when we have it, we kind of have a, a surprise about what we're feeling, we want to feel it, so like uh, the definition of emotion is locked uh, within the state of emotion, so how then get out of this? <laughs> Uh -huh. So maybe okay. that emotion does not exist and we're like kind of inventing some extra phenomena that doesn't exist. Mm. So you're saying that maybe meta emotion is an inherent part of the emotional reaction, so it's impossible to distinguish between the two, which is 
which I think it, that might be true. It might, it, it might be the case that my emotions are necessarily a byproduct or a consequence or an inherent part of an emotional reaction. Uh, which is also something that Mendonca claims, that any theory of emotion has to include uh, meta-emotion as a component to it. So that might, might be the case, but I think it's still important to uh, make... I mean, regardless of your opinions on whether an emotion would always be accompanied by a meta-emotion, I think it's useful to distinguish between different... Uh, Components, maybe not the components I suggested, but to start kind of put, pulling the concept apart because when people are talking about meta emotions, they're talking about many different things. And to your first point about the theatre, so the actor who, who um, I don't know, pretends to be angry every night at the stage and who experiences uh, meta emotion. I think that would be a, a case of what is referred to as a non-veridical meta-emotion. So the fact that there's a meta-emotion there doesn't necessarily mean that the primary emotion is what it appears to be or what you think it is. Okay, thank but you. it's an interesting point, <laughs> <laughs> certainly. And one final question. <laughs> thank you. Fascinating. Well, um, actually, just really, I wanted you to uh, speculate on the relationship between uh, mindfulness and this sort of access to like the metro emotion that you see the part of the value of mindfulness uh, becoming more and more prevalent and effective uh, intervention in your own problems whether that is actually part of the powers mm. from the ability to therefore retrain that I think there's certainly an overlap there. I mean, the, this whole idea of being able to accurately identify and label your emotions, it would, be surprise, it would surprise me if that's not related to individual differences in mindfulness. And also these uh, acceptance subscales or items that people have suggested. Um, so I think there's, uh, there's overlap there. I think that's uh, probably addressed in the study by Mitman Skruber because they looked at both of these phenomena, but off the top of my head I can't uh, recall the details of how those upper scales were related, but certainly, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.